Well, ladies and gentlemen, Elena, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today, and I want to give special thanks to the Kiev School of Economics for the invitation. Um, Kiev School of Economics was the first educational institution in Ukraine to train Ukrainian economists in English, and according to the best international standards. The contribution the school has made to Ukraine has been discreet sometimes, but it's huge. And uh, many young, talented Ukrainian economists have helped private public institutions, uh, and they were educated at KSC. Two of my own team members uh, were part of uh, the school, so I have to be personally and professionally thankful, Roman Kachuk and uh, my deputy minister, and um, my head of staff, uh, Ivan Yudek, so very grateful personally. And I also want to thank Box Ukraine, who are a real source of valuable economic analysis for us. Um, constant in-depth research, all the writing that you do and all the analysis you do on major topics brings insights to society, but also to us. Sometimes we're not always seeing it the same way that you are, so we're very grateful. For, for too long, Ukraine's leadership has probably been despised, uh, it, it has despised independent thinking. Uh, the concept of you're either with us or you're against us has been an obstacle to building a strong and effective civil society. And that's the reason I wanted to come today to support your independent economic thinking. Uh, we need the contribution, we need the new ideas. Uh, if I start with the debt and the deficit, uh, during uh, the Yanukovych presidency as a result of the kleptocracy and the unsound macroeconomic policies, Ukraine's debt almost doubled from $39 billion to 76, over $76 billion. As it stands, if we were to not restructure our debt, which I guarantee you we will restructure our debt, but if we were not to do it, the servicing of the debt would cost Ukraine some 13% of its state budget this year, uh, and that's if you'd like to compare to the fact that we're spending 15% of our state budget on security, national security, and law enforcement. So you can tell that that is a heavy burden for a country at war. The continuing war in the East has obviously exacerbated our macroeconomic disequilibrium, and it has added a devastating economic and humanitarian cost. Uh, as you know, when this government was elected, uh, the country was on the verge of a financial meltdown. I think uh, the question then becomes, what do you do when you're faced with this type of situation? And I'll, I'll kind of walk through four steps that I think need to be taken simultaneously. We, we were just at another presentation uh, for the book written about Mr. Kaka Benzikidze. And um, I think it was a colleague of ours, a Russian economist on the stage, who spoke and said, said uh, that there's no order uh, to reforms. You just need to do everything as quickly as possible and stop debating what's first and third. So I'll name these four steps, and I'm not suggesting there's a particular order to them. First, we needed to pull back from the precipice and avoid a looming I think we've succeeded in that with the support of the international community, and particularly the help of the IMF with the four-year extended fund facility. By March, uh, end of March, uh, the IMF's first tranche enabled us to double our reserves from five to ten billion dollars. Um, that, that represents approximately two months critical imports. It's not a safe zone, but it's much safer than one month's critical imports. As a second step, uh, we need to negotiate with our international partners to improve the medium-term sustainability of our debt. The IMF estimates our needs uh, for the next four-year period to be about $40 billion. And rather than debate the number, let's look at where the 40 comes from. Uh, it could be more, obviously. Uh, hopefully it'll be less, but that's an estimate in a difficult environment to forecast. Uh, the 40 comes $17.5 billion from the four-year uh, EFF program from the IMF. It comes from about $7.5 billion from our multilateral bilateral partners, the United States graciously $2 billion, the EU 1.8 billion euro and onwards. And then the remaining piece, uh, when you 40 minus 25, the 15, 15.3 billion is the savings we're supposed to accomplish through a debt restructuring uh, to reduce the pressure on our balance of payments. We're negotiating now uh, with the holders of the public debt to generate this savings, but I think it's important to also note it's not only about a four-year balance of payment savings. It's also about debt sustainability. So we have a second target, which is to meet a debt-to-GDP ratio of no more than 71% by the year 2020. And third, and this is relevant for fiscal policy in particular, uh, that we, by 2019, reach uh, the point where our payment capacity, where our amortization of this debt is no more than 10% of our GDP. That means I can't simply restructure the debt and push all the payments out to the year 2021 because I need to be able to balance it over time. And that's why the restructuring with those three targets requires not only a, an extension, but also it requires some type of haircut, nominal and or coupon in some combination. 
Um, I think in parallel, just to be clear, the $7.5 billion of support, the reason I don't go into often whether or not 40 is the right number or not, is because the 7.5 really represents one year, 18 months of commitments from the United States, the EU, the EBRD, the EIB. And I would expect us, and I am constantly trying to raise additional monies, uh, because that process obviously takes time. So you can see sometimes some of the press, especially the opposition press, uh, some, sometimes the Russian press, uh, paints a picture that I'm out there constantly asking for money. But my thought is that we're constantly looking towards the future. And this is the situation as we see it today. Well, all of you can only imagine when the Minsk agreements, uh, when and if the Minsk agreements are successful and we have peace in our land again and the occupied territories are no longer occupied, we have a rebuilding to go forward with. And so our needs will only grow with peace. They won't be lower. The third step is for us to create the right conditions for the return of economic growth and investment. Our real GDP decline continued in the first quarter at a rate that's unacceptable, and we need to stem that real GDP growth decline. It's something that keeps the government up day and night. It's a daunting task. Um, I could talk about it, but I'll skip it for today. My Minister of Economy is really the guru on this area of deregulation, state-owned enterprise reform, and I'll return to the issues of fiscal management. And that fourth step on budgetary and fiscal management is increasing our fiscal revenues and decreasing our expenditures. But that's not as easy as it seems. Um, there's no way for us to take a slash and burn approach today to the budget. There are five principles that we keep in mind in our budgetary policy right now. The first is that we need to be fair. Uh, for too long, Ukraine, in Ukraine, many uh, individual business people, individual business, business interests have stolen and cheated the system, while those who suffer most uh, the Ukrainians who are working hard, who are getting their salaries paid legally, the businesses that have operate, chosen to operate legally, um, pay their fair share and, and, and shoulder an unfair burden. It's an unacceptable uh, policy. We need to have a zero tolerance policy with regard to corruption, waste, inefficiency in the government. Some of the things that we're doing in this direction, we're closing the fiscal loopholes and getting rid of the transfer pricing that enabled oligarchs and large business uh, with commodity sales to transfer their profits abroad and not share the tax burden here in this country. We've introduced a new electronic VAT system specifically to, reduce, to, to increase transparency, reduce fraud, there is at least one fraud mechanism that will be eliminated that last year, the year before, in 2013, we estimated uh, caused a loss in budget revenues of a billion dollars. Hopefully that we put an end to that with this new electronic VAT system. We're working to bring the commercial sector out of the shadow. 50% or you guys know better than I, 40%, 60% of the economy is not participating in the formal economy. And it's, again, an unfair burden uh, for the, f the people operating legally to bear. And this is something we've tried to reduce with the payroll tax discount of 16.5%. But also, it's going to have to be uh, part of our tax administration program. In the energy sector, we eliminated major sources of corruption by eliminating intermediaries in the purchase of gas. So we no longer have any uh, businesses uh, by in, in between uh, Nafta Gas, our state oil and gas monopoly, and Gazprom in Russia, or with the Europeans with, from whom we buy now two-thirds of our gas. There are no intermediaries left in that trade. That has also helped us to eliminate the deficit of Nafta Gas, something that was a major fiscal burden on the country last year. The, the deficit of Nafta Gas was 110 billion hryvnia, about $10.5 billion larger than the state deficit. Uh, and financing that is a cause of inflation, it's a cause of corruption, it's a cause of, of all kinds of fiscal and, and non-fiscal uh, problems in the country. This year, the, the, by, by eliminating intermediaries, by reducing the cost of gas generally, uh, with the diversification of, of the sourcing of gas, and with the uh, ability to move our subsidies away from nafta gas to the population. We've reduced that deficit to 29.7 billion hryvnia, or about one and a half billion dollars. From 10 to one and a half is a big difference. We've also committed to wipe it out entirely by the end of 2016 to move to a non-deficit. Um, raising residential gas tariffs, probably one of the most painful, but also one of the most radical things that's been done by this government. Uh, we raised uh, natural gas tariffs for the households by 450% April 1st, heating by 70% is something that's part of a two-year program. This year, we're achieving, hopefully, 50% economic cost recovery. Next year, April 1st, we will be looking towards 75% economic cost recovery. And then within two years, 100% economic cost recovery. By eliminating the subsidies, we're, again, moving away from subsidizing the gas, which has its own set of issues, to providing instead, on a means-tested basis, the most vulnerable part of the population subsidies. It moves part of that deficit to the budget, 
but it's a much more fair, transparent way to spend the monies, and we get the effect of eliminating the rent-seeking behaviors of players who've been cheating in the market for industry. We also get the ability to increase energy efficiency by people understanding the price and hopefully using less gas. Um, these are the things that I think we've done on the, on the issue of being uh, hopefully more fair. We also need to be more responsible. The British say if you take care of the pennies, the pounds will look after themselves. So there are several areas in budgetary spending that we look forward to in, in this year to look forward to the next budget. Uh, the expenditures on education uh, this year plan to be about 105 billion hryvnia. Uh, we estimate that some of these funds are not being spent effectively. It's not a surprise, I think, and that the optimization of education should significantly increase uh, the effectiveness of the budgetary funds in education. Another area is social subsidies. We continue to eliminate cross programs that, that duplicate, that, that have a, a cost uh, both for implementation, but also eliminate the ability to really target who needs what. So just recently, we've taken three energy-related subsidy programs and reduced it to two. And then over time, our goal is to take away the third and have one single program, one single set of benefits that's clear for those who are in need. Finally, we need to fight inefficiencies in the pension system. We've started that, but the total pension bill is still about 14% of GDP, among the highest in the world. And simultaneously, and this is the part that, that hurts the Ukrainian people, it's one of the smallest pensions received by people in the world. And so uh, there's this constant contrast. We're spending so much and they're getting so little. We just can't afford to keep doing that. It's not only a problem for fiscal policy, but it's a social policy issue as well. Um, here we'll need more export support and how to move forward, how to move uh, away from uh, the pension fund, the system that we currently have, and how to take the next steps. It's, it's not the Ministry of Finance's area of expertise, but we will be pushing very hard because of the fiscal effect of having to finance that deficit. Um, from the end of 2013 to February this year, the government managed to shrink public and guaranteed debt by 20%. Uh, the devaluation of the hryvnia, unfortunately, counteracted this, and so uh, we uh, increased the debt by a factor of three in just the past year in nominal hryvnia. <clears throat> Notwithstanding this, our goal is to reduce the total public finance deficit this year uh, to 8.8 percent of GDP. A reminder, last year it was over 11, so uh, it's, a, it's a step forward. Third, we need to be strategic. Uh, we can't cut the board equally across, the budget equally across everyone and increase taxes on everyone. We're in the 10th quarter of a recession with one or two exceptions in the middle. And uh, we need to keep calm and clear focused minds. I think we've reduced the budgets of all ministries but one. That's the Ministry of Defense, no surprise. And I believe that you'll probably agree with me that we're unable to cut at this stage the Ministry of Defense at a time when we're trying to protect the country's sovereignty. But that said, <clears throat> I'd hope, I, I pray, and my position will be that we not spend more than the 5.3% of GDP that we're currently spending on the defense going forward. That's an increase compared of, of two percentage points of GDP compared to the previous years. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that the, end, the war will end, and this won't be necessary anymore, but you can imagine it was a part of our country that was very poorly financed up until now. On the revenue front, um, I'm hoping that Mr. Miklos gives me all the answers, but basically we're trying to take a holistic review of our tax policy aside from what we've done uh, to date on a marginal basis, marginal incremental changes, to look whether or not there's a way to radically change our tax policy for the year starting January 1st, 2016, inspire business with simplicity, eliminate corruption with simplicity, encourage fairness, and encourage again the shadow economy to participate again uh, because it's so radically, hopefully, fair, clean, transparent, and different. Um, the fourth principle is that we need to be more just, and I guess here uh, the issue is, again, we have a growing poverty in this country, uh, and we're going to need to continue to focus our social programs on the poor and our revenues on the poor. Uh, as a result of inflation and the loss of bank deposit incomes last year, real household disposable income shrunk by an estimated 30 percent. The provision of basic food and medicines has become the main priority for many families in this country, and UN experts have expected a surge in the poverty rate to some 30 percent. This is important not because I'm a socialist, but this is important because, frankly speaking, this is what populists use to stop the other reforms. And until and un unless we can actually deliver some absolute safety and support mechanism for the poor, we will not have the time to implement the rest of the reforms that we need to implement. So it's critical not only because it's the just thing to do, but also because it's the only way for us to ensure the other reforms move forward. 
I guess I, I'll just say the fifth, the fifth issue is modesty, um, the fifth principle we need to maintain. Uh, we're all human. We make mistakes. I've, I, I can explain one that we did in the royalty area for uh, gas and oil extraction. We're now working on trying to fix that for July, by July 1st uh, for implementation January 1st. It's, it's not an easy environment in which to do reforms, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge the mistakes when we make them and then move as quickly as possible to fixing them. Now, in conclusion, I guess I'll just say that um, today uh, our budget deficit taken together with Nafta Gas Pension Fund um, will decrease to 5.8 percent of GDP. Uh, it's uh, slightly more than half of last year's. So we were about 10 percent taking all of these deficits together. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue that trajectory. I'm, I'm confident that if this government uh, continues down the path that it's, it's started, we will be able to continue to reduce that, that, that fiscal deficit, and that is clearly the target. Um, I know the pace is never quick enough. It's not quick enough for any of us in government, nor for anyone outside of government. I guess I, I think that um, we need to work together. I need your support. I need your ideas. And um, I look forward to hearing about them. And I look forward to working with you so we can progress more quickly, more effectively uh, together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, we will have a, a time for, Q, for questions and answers after all the speakers will uh, make their speeches. And I personally have many follow-up questions, but I will not ask you now. And uh, I actually would like to ask Ivan, so Ivan, you already know that you have to explain everyone about the revenue side of the budget. Um, and my question would be actually that is it possible for, uh, for any country to increase revenues without hurting the businesses, without increasing basically taxes. And uh, Ukraine had to increase tax rates for some and introduce some taxation to improve its uh, fiscal, uh, to, to improve uh, fiscal balance. But maybe there is, there is other receipt. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, this is one of the most important questions, how to uh, do necessary macroeconomic stabilization, stabilization, fiscal consolidation, and at the same time achieve economic growth as soon as possible. Because only if you will have economic growth, you will not destroy your social system, your education system, healthcare, and so on and so on. And only, only if you will have good uh, business environment, you can achieve economic growth. And of course, it, this, is, this is very difficult, and there is also a question maybe if it is even possible to have, at least from the short-term perspective, to macroeconomic stabilization and, uh, and uh, economic growth. I think it is possible, and simply saying necessary precondition for this is doing reforms as deeper as possible, as comprehensive, complex, if you want, radical as possible. And as Natalie has mentioned, uh, I very agree with uh, this, this was Kaka Bendukides words that there is no time for waiting to do first reform in this area, then reforms in second area, then, then in third area. There is no time for this, I mean, in any transition countries, but in, uh, in Ukraine now especially, because it is not necessary to explain that Ukraine is in, in especially uh, difficult, difficult situation. Which means, what is very important, what I feel, I have to say, I feel as, as uh, maybe not understood enough uh, that macroeconomic stabilization is absolutely necessary precondition for to have economic, sustainable economic growth. If you are speaking about macroeconomic stabilization, it has two main parts. First one is fiscal consolidation, which was explained in details by, by Mr. Finance, Natalie Yarisko. But this is also a financial sector, which means banks especially, but also other financial institutions, recovering, restructuring, and stabilizing. We know that also in this area, situation is not, is not good. Necessary precondition, macroeconomic, without uh, to have macroeconomic stabilization, and in your case, uh, in the Ukrainian case, macroeconomic stabilization is uh, dependent on, on, on the more measures, but for instance, energy price deregulation is one of the most important preconditions for this. Without this, it will be not only uh, uh, a country will not able to stabilize and, and consolidate uh, public finance, but also it will be impossible to fight against corruption. Also, it will be impossible to restructure economy to have less energy, uh, de energy demand. 
economy to be less 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 uh, uh, dependent on Russia and so on and so on. It has it has many many of of uh, connotations in this in this regard, which means. What is very important is to use this time, use this year, as much as possible for, for macroeconomic stabilization and also for preparing deep structural reforms. And this is the point. If there are reforms in all areas and together fiscal consolidation and macroeconomic and macro stabilization and structural reforms, if they are prepared, implemented at the same time as soon as possible, only then you have chance that you, that country will achieve high and sustainable economic growth. Why it is important and how it is interconnected. You can achieve short-time fiscal consolidation by cutting some expenditures, by increasing some taxes. But without structural reforms on the revenue side, for instance, in the social system, in the healthcare system, in the education, as it was mentioned uh, by, by Natalie, it will be only short term. It will have only short term effect. If you want to have longer term, term effect, it has to be interconnected. Another example is tax reform and improvement of business environment. Without, uh, without tax reform, you can, from the short term perspective, by cutting some expenditures and increasing some taxes, you can partially stabilize public finance, but only uh, in the short term, not in the mid and long term perspective. Which means this will be, this will be very, very important to use this year, year 2015, for, to provide as much as possible macro stabilization measures, especially fiscal consolidation measures and financial sector recovering measures, and at the same time prepare to use this year for preparedness of the deep structural reforms. If I'm speaking about deep structural reforms, I'm speaking about the reforms like public finance reform, tax reform, fiscal decentralization, social system reform, healthcare reform, labor market reform, and other reforms like also law enforcement improvement, but not in all areas there will be the, the same quick results, but in almost all areas it is necessary to start, start as soon as possible and not, not to waste time. Another problem is that you have to be really radical and, uh, and, and, and uh, comprehensive and complex in, in your approach. Of course it is possible, not possible, it is inevitable that there will be mistakes. But uh, in comparison with alternative, it will be still much, much better. I am deeply convinced that Ukraine now can, can choose only from two possibilities, risky reforms, radical and risky reforms, or hopeless changes. And in this regard, uh, to use this year will be, will be, will be, will be very, very, very important. Uh, let me show you that this is possible to achieve, and let me show you this on figures. I will ask for the second picture. These are, are figures from, from my country, from Slovakia. Uh, we did this kind of very complex and comprehensive reforms, and we did both macroeconomic stabilization measures and also deep structural reforms. We had more time for this, but what was, what was the most important, there are more, more, uh, many figures there, but the most important are figures between 2002, 2003, 2004. Why? Because in, in 2003 was a year in which we prepared, we were in similar from point of view of macro stabilization and structural reforms. In 2003, Slovakia was in the similar situation like Ukraine is now. And we used this year, 2003, for preparing uh, macro stabilization, fiscal consolidation, and also, also uh, structural reforms. And many of these reforms, which I have mentioned before, were implemented from the beginning of 2004. And you can see from these figures that between 2000, in 2002, we had um, budget deficits, deficit 8.2%. We significantly reduced it in uh, 2003 for 2.8%. 2 also, public debt to GDP decreased at that time. But what was the most important? At the same time, if you look at the GDP growth, from 2002, 2003, 2004, we achieved very high economic growth, the highest in all Europe at that time, thanks to this combination of macro stabilization measures and structural reforms. 
What is very important from point of view of questions which, I, which, which were mentioned by Olena is also that on one side, we achieved a reduction of, of the public revenues as shared to GDP, as you can see from almost 40% of GDP in 2000 to about 33% only in 2008. But it is in a relative term. At the same time, because very high economic growth, we achieved very high growth of the public revenues in, public, in, in absolute term. And it is written uh, under the, the, the figures that every year, growth of the real revenues was, uh, was uh, about 10% in period 2003-2008. Which means, I would like to um, just illustrate on this that it works. This is not only theory, this is practical experience that if there are uh, really complex, really comprehensive and radical reform, if fo reforms are focused, not only for fiscal consolidation, macroeconomic stabilization, but also for really deep structural reforms and radical reforms. Our tax reform was one of the most radical maybe in the world, but it really worked. It worked better than, than were our, our, our most optimistic expectations. And that was the reason why this economic growth, foreign direct investment in flux, and so on and so on. Last, last uh, remark. I'm, uh, many times hearing here in Ukraine that yes, but uh, you were much better preconditions because uh, Slovakia didn't have war, fortunately, and at that time it was global economic boom, and that this is true. But my answer is yes, but this is not reason for uh, not doing in Ukraine this kind of reforms. This is even a reason for doing even more reforms, even more radical, even more complex reforms in Ukraine, because Ukraine is in more difficult situation today as with Slovakia last time. And really last remarks is, remark is that what is the most important? And any time if I'm asking what, what was the most, um, most important precondition? One, the most important precondition for doing successful reforms. My answer is very simple, political leadership. Reforms are from 90%, not the technical problem. After 25 years of transition, we have a lot of good, bad experience from many countries. Reforms are mostly political problem. And political leadership is necessary precondition for doing, for doing reforms. Political re leadership means that there's also, also ownership of reforms. Let me put it on this ownership. It is necessary speak with people, communicate with them, explain them, openly say them, okay, we are in difficult situation, we have to do, for instance, this energy, energy deregulation because it is good for our country, because without this we cannot improve situation. And it's necessary to convince people that we are doing reforms, not because IMF is pushing to us, because we have program with the IMF, with the World Bank, but because we need these reforms. Ukrainian people and Ukraine needs these reforms. This is ownership of reforms. And we have a lot of examples that in countries in which it it was strong leadership and ownership of reforms, these countries succeeded, these countries were successful. And we have also other examples. Greece is the best example, if, if not the worst, of lack of ownership of reforms. If reforms are done only because Troika is pushing, IMF is pushing, then you can see what is the result of this kind of reform performance. Which means, uh, let me conclude that um, I'm convinced that Ukraine has now preconditions for to be successful, for to prepare and implement this combination of macroeconomic stabilization measures and structural reforms. And the most important preconditions are fulfilled. It was Maidan, it was presidential elections, and there was parliamentary election, because these events brought Ukraine representatives with strong mandate from the people to do reforms and to integrate Ukraine to, to Europe. And you have very good government which is able to do it, and I am convinced that we will do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. I just wanted to mention to the audience that actually uh, Ivan was recognized as a top business reformer uh, by the World Bank doing business report. Uh, report right <laughs> uh, 
in uh, 2004, actually, it's for the tax reform that you did. And then my next question would be to the founder of this ranking, to uh, Simeon Djankov. So, Simeon, from your experience um, as a finance minister and as a, a researcher, is there kind of an optimal a uh, pace of fiscal consolidation, because I mean, many people think that many Ukraine is moving too slow towards kind of a, uh, uh, reduces budget deficit too slowly. If you're on the outside, it always looks too slow. If you're on the inside and have to do it, <laughs> it looks at uh, breakneck, <laughs> breakneck um, speed. Um, I thought what uh, words of advice I can um, offer to the Ukrainian reformers from my experience in the Bulgarian government as finance minister, deputy prime minister. And I wish I could say that we had this very difficult situation similar as Ukraine and, um, and we have uh, a lot of words of wisdom, but actually, while well, it was a difficult situation with Greece uh, going bankrupt, Romania being in a difficult situation uh, next to us, Serbia, let's be serious, the situation now in Ukraine is a lot more difficult than in any country in our region for many, many years and probably one of the most difficult in any country in the world now. So instead of uh, um, coming from my Bulgarian uh, experience as finance minister, I thought of another statistic, uh, probably not many of you know it, that, uh, that uh, links Bulgaria and Ukraine, which is that in the last 10 years or so, consistently every year, in surveys that ask people, are you happy with your life, controlling for how rich they are, controlling for how long they live, controlling for a number of other indicators that you would think would make people happy or not. Ukraine consistently comes as the unhappiest country in the world, of all countries in the world, and Bulgaria is number two. Um, in general, in our region, there are a lot of such countries, so Serbia is there, Russia, and so on. But, uh, but I've often wondered in the case of Bulgaria, why is it that given where we are in income, in social indicators, um, Bulgarians are so unhappy? And also, as uh, somebody in the government, what does it imply for me as a reformer? How, how do I go about, um, uh, about reforms? Uh, and on that basis, I would offer two pieces of, um, uh, uh, of advice. But let me mention that while the answer to this question is still outstanding, the highest correlation correlate between unhappiness of the people, both in Ukraine and Bulgaria, is corruption. It's not the budget deficit. It's not how much is spent on uh, pensions or on one or other indicator. It's the perception of corruption. So the short answer of why we are so unhappy is that we believe, given where we are as countries, that uh, corruption is too, too high in our countries. And since I was asked to illustrate this in one slide, here is the slide behind me, which is basically a corruption indicator uh, on the horizontal and some measure of democracy, if you like, civil liberties on the vertical. So I've uh, showed all countries in transition, and you basically see two groups at the bottom, much of the former Soviet Union, high corruption, not much liberty. At the top, basically all EU accession countries. Uh, and then in the middle, remarkably, they're basically the countries who are thinking of joining the EU. Some have made steps to join the EU, uh, like Georgia and Ukraine, and hope to be in this, uh, in this, um, uh, in this high categories. But this is a ranking that is also quite consistent across the last um, uh, few years. Why am I talking in a fiscal panel so much about corruption and the perception of corruption? Well, here are my two uh, points I would like to make. When discussing fiscal measures, when discussing the deficit, the reform team, the finance minister, are going to be unpopular. They're unpopular in every country, uh, especially when they have to cut so much of the budget, uh, uh, of the budget deficit. Uh, and if you talk about how much you need to cut, if you talk about all these things that uh, need to be done for fiscal stability, you become even more unpopular. So, so unfortunately, uh, this is going to be with us for some time. But uh, if you manage to remember to address the audience on the issue that they're unhappiest about, which is corruption or the perception of corruption, you can hope at least 
to have some leeway on some of these difficult uh, on some of these difficult reforms. And Natalie already mentioned a few of them. So in a short period of time, corruption or however you can call it bribes just in the energy sector have been cut uh, tenfold. I found that people have trouble sort of imagining what a billion is and what 10 billion is. <laughs> it looks very large number. But if we remember to address the audience in this way and say, that we are doing some reforms and cutting uh, uh, expenditures because otherwise they just go into somebody's pockets. They are not actually used for anything uh, useful. Education was, uh, uh, was mentioned. They make somebody rich. Uh, and we have a lot of examples of Ukrainian oligarchs uh, who are rich not because they are entrepreneurial, not because they are innovative, because they have been milking the government for the last 20, uh, 20 some uh, years. But remembering to address the audience, and not just from a fiscal perspective we need to do this, but in this way we're reducing corruption. And this is actually the best way to reduce corruption. Ivan knows from his uh, uh, experience how corruption was a huge issue in Slovakia in 1999 when they started. And then in three years, exactly three years, they jumped something like four steps on all corruption um, indicators because of the reforms that they uh, made. He was very uh, humble about it, so I'm, uh, I'm mentioning it uh, instead of him. So this is the first point. Remember to address the audience on what they care about. Nobody cares about budget deficits other than 100 maybe macroeconomies. But a lot of people care if you tell them in this way we reduce corruption and the money that is left is left for you, is left for other, uh, uh, other activities, social or economic activities. And the second point, which I never managed to do, I admit, uh, in my career as, uh, as um, finance minister, I don't think Ivan managed either so much, but to take a breath, step back and basically say, we are doing so many things. It looks like we have to do a lot, a lot of other uh, uh, things uh, today, tomorrow, the day, the day after tomorrow. But what is achieved already? In a short period of time, you've already achieved uh, a lot. It is useful when it is achieved to explain it again, to explain it in simple words, not the words of macroeconomists, investment bankers, uh, um, people who have been in the government or policy makers, in the words of the people who are following you, they are suffering from this, they know they are going to suffer in the future, again because of all the necessary steps and reforms that you are making. Do remember now, not in two weeks, not in uh, a month, now to basically tell them why is it that what we are doing now is helpful for them. I find that many reformers, especially reformers that try to do a lot at the same time, just forget to do, uh, to do this. And I think to me, where reforms have not been consistent over time, it has been because of the lack of, uh, a lack of communication. We made a lot of mistakes in Bulgaria, so I'm talking about this from words of uh, experience, and I hope that uh, you would avoid the mistakes that other reformers have made. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. But as we are almost all economists, we do care about budget deficits. Sorry for this. <laughs> okay. Uh, another another question that is in my mind is, and which is uh, often discussed in regard to Ukraine's public finance, is um, is this um, amount of uh, budget expenditures as in relation to GDP. So uh, they're close to 50 percent. Uh, some observers say that it's even about 50 percent. And my Okay, it, it's 47, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's 40 something. <laughs> okay, but uh, there, is, there is a kind of criticism that they are way too high and then this ratio needs to be reduced. So the, the question that is raised also is that Ukraine in this regard needs an austerity. And that's what I wanted to ask. We don't have yeah. austerity. Oh, uh, Let's let let let's maybe listen to to, to our panelists. But it's not 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 me. I mean, that's what I wanted to ask. Does the country need some kind of austerity or not? Given that, uh, I mean, given the numbers which we have, Pierre, please. Thank you, thank you also for inviting me to this uh, 
fascinating discussion. I must say I was very much inspired by the uh, Minister's five principles. I think that's exactly what is needed to address uh, the, not only the issue of fiscal consolidation in Ukraine, but basically how to conceive of a strategy of reform over time uh, to restore growth and uh, install democracy, fairness, responsibility, strategy, justice, and modesty. And I, and I was uh, even surprised that the Minister mentioned modesty because if modesty should apply to someone, it's to the advisors. And what you are doing in terms of policymaker taking the risks every day of action inspires all. And it's very easy for advisors to say, you should do this and that, and generally to be rather silent about how these things should be done. So uh, I think that principle of modesty should extend well beyond what, uh, what you mentioned and include the whole academic profession, especially when talking about fiscal consolidation in times of huge crisis, because we know probably a lot of things about fiscal policy, its role, its uh, dangers, uh, about fiscal consolidation in normal times, even though there are still some debates, but uh, to derive uh, sound principles of fiscal consolidation uh, during a crisis, it is something which is much more, much more uh, difficult. Uh, and especially at times in which uh, citizens' expect expectations are high, not only in terms of rise of income, but in terms of democratic uh, expectations uh, as well. Uh, so that there are high expectations and a risk of disappointment, which ties up with the earlier discussions today about the, this, the, the, the relation between expectation, disappointment, and happiness. Let me um, mention what I think are two major problematic issues with fiscal consolidation that need to be addressed in any program. One is economic and the other one is political economic. From an economic point of view, it is the fact, and I think there is maybe not unanimity but a wide consensus on that, that fiscal contraction during an economic crisis is problematic. It is problematic because it deepens the recession and it makes fiscal consolidation less likely to happen. So we need to take that into account. It means that any path of fiscal consolidation need to be to really look at the interaction between the fiscal measures and the way in which GDP will react. And that is something that is not really scientific. It's very much often a question of judgment. And it is a very uh, difficult one. There are academic debates about what is called the size of multipliers when you reduce uh, public expenses or when you, uh, when you increase uh, public taxation, what does it do to the GDP? And uh, unfortunately, there is a, a lot of lack of agreement on that. There is a recent paper on Ukraine, actually, last, last March, an, IM, an IMF paper, that shows that the multipliers may be small, so that the GDP costs of consolidating now may be smaller than expected. And at the same time, there is a major study also at the IMF, conducted by the chief economist, uh, Olivier Blanchard, and uh, one of his colleagues, uh, that show that uh, fiscal multipliers during crisis were always systematically underestimated, and that led to underestimate, basically, the GDP costs of, of adjustment. So it, it's, it's a debate that doesn't lead to any specific result, but the bottom line is that uh, a crisis time is, is not a good time to, uh, to, to, to cut, uh, to, 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 to consolidate a budget. And then comes the political economy problem, which is that a non-crisis time is not a good time either to consolidate, to consolidate uh, fiscal policy. And in the end, it may be that the crisis time is the unique opportunity that is left to uh, find the strength to take the tough measures to, consol to consolidate the budget and to engage reforms. And that links very much with the debate in Europe right now, in Western Europe. We, we have a very peculiar situation in which probably a lot of economists would agree that uh, fiscal austerity, quote unquote, I'll come back in a minute on austerity, is not a good idea. But politically it's inescapable because the feeling has been that we have overutilized fiscal flexibility for too long with very poor results and at times in which we could do it, many of our countries, including my country, uh, France, uh, didn't actually engage in reforms. So it's a bizarre view of the world in which, for political reasons, you believe that crises are absolutely necessary to do th things that are good and that should be done 
outside crisis. This uh, difficult connection between economics and politics is one of the major difficulties to, uh, to conduct transition. From an economic point of view, fiscal stabilization is not a short-term measure. It doesn't have to do with the current deficit. Almost any deficit could be financed if you find people willing to help you finance it. The problem is a problem over time. Fiscal consolidation or fiscal sustainability is a very simple idea. It is that the flow of future spending should be in line with the flow of, the flow of expected future income. It has very, very little to do with the current situation. So in theory, the response to an unsustainable fiscal situation that may be characterized by a succession of high deficits may not be to immediately cut the deficits, it is to engage in reform that will bear on the future flow of public spending and the future flow of public uh, income. Uh, the, that is a theory. In principle, it's difficult to put in place because reforms displace vested interest, and it means that without the pressure of the short-term constraint, it's very uh, difficult politically to conduct these uh, reforms. What do the uh, and, and uh, that also illustrates a debate that I find fascinating about terminology. What, what, what is, why do we, we call? Why, what do we talk about austerity? Austerity is not needed. It is not an objective per se. What is needed is rigor. It is a fact of managing this flow of expenditure in line with the flow of income. That is rigor. It is absolutely normal. There shouldn't even be a debate about it. And rigor is defined intertemporally. We have financial markets that allow to finance debt today, uh, provided it will be, of course, paid in the, in the future. This is what fiscal sustainability is about. It has very, very little to do with the current level of the deficit. Now, what does it, what does it le le leave us uh, about uh, uh, Ukraine? Well, I think the, the, the challenge, of, of course, we all know that the current fiscal situation is unbalanced, but this is the case in a very large number of countries. It's not specifically Ukra Ukrainian. And I think what strikes an observer, of, an outside observer of Ukraine, is the incredibly challenging transition that needs to be financed, not only budgetary, but of course, political, institutional, democratic, economic. And that in itself will, will displace a lot of established and vested interest. So the political economy of reform implies that losers should be at least partially compensated or compensated enough so that they're going to be willing to play the game even if they are part of the current elite. So that's a crucial political economy uh, principle for uh, uh, reform. And as emphasized by, by uh, John Roland uh, uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, this shouldn't come as an outcome from enlightened despotism. It shouldn't come as an outcome of reformist Bolshevism. It has to be anchored in a democratic process. Democratic transition is the ultimate objective. So when we think about fiscal, and that's why we are back to the principle that were mentioned by the minister, thinking about fiscal consolidation is not thinking about cutting the deficit. It is thinking about putting in line a, a, a step of action, a, a pace of action that will respect these principles and therefore can be anchored in a democratic process in which at each point in time there will be enough support for the reforms. That is tremendously difficult to do. I don't think it's a subject for academic to really give advice on, Minister. I think you are, you are, you, you are giving academic a wonderful field of experiment, and for that you should be, uh, of course, commended. The real issue is over the long term. Almost any deficit is valuable in the short term, provided there is long-term action to maintain uh, sustainability. Uh, that also is linked to the willingness of the partners in the West, notably, to help Ukraine uh, manage this process in a gradual way. And I personally hope that these partners will be there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. So I was rewarded for being uh, provocative now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my final question is definitely to uh, uh, Ilona. And um, actually here I would like to touch a point of the fiscal rule because uh, definitely we, we we not only need to reach some uh, sound uh, public finance, but we need to sustain public finances in a sound uh, stance. So, and uh, I mean, uh, in many countries, fiscal rules help to do this. And Ilona, from your perspective, do you think 
fiscal rule make sense for Ukraine? Will it help uh, from the long-term perspective to keep public finances on track? I'll get to your question in a moment. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, could you please pass me the remote control? Okay. Thank you. I am a violator of the rules myself because I have more than one slide here, so <laughs> probably. Um, so the fiscal rules is a long-term uh, limits for the main uh, fiscal policy parameters, and the main uh, reason for the introduction was already mentioned here. It's the time and consistency problem. Uh, all the, uh, as long as the governments are rather short-sighted, they are limited by, by the political cycle. They want to either cut taxes or increase spending to please their voters and then get re-elected. Uh, but by doing this, uh, they increase budget deficit and uh, state debt. And this debt is uh, transferred to future generations, uh, which, uh, taking into account our dem demographic situation, uh, will be less numerous than the current generation. So obviously, the burden for them uh, will be even higher. Uh, I've looked through the literature about the fiscal rules and there is no consensus whether to introduce them or not or and whether uh, which, what kind of rules should be introduced and so on. So we can just, uh, I hope you can see, uh, this is the overview of the fiscal rules that are employed uh, in different countries and the first and the most old uh, rules is uh, the limit on the state debt uh, invented uh, precisely to tackle this inconsistency problem. Mm. And then uh, the next rules kind of build on uh, this first rule because to reduce or to hold uh, the debt within the limits, you need to control the budget deficit and uh, the next generation so-called fiscal rules uh, to control the budget deficit, you need to control expenditures uh, and revenues. Uh, so there, is, there are some rules on expenditure that, uh, for example, expenditure cannot grow faster than e uh, economic growth or uh, there can be a limit on expenditures as a percent of GDP and also there can be some uh, revenue rules that set uh, floors or ceilings on revenues and also set uh, predetermine the use of windfall revenues like for example when uh, oil prices grow and all uh, ex exporting countries get this unexpected revenues. Uh, now, 83 countries have uh, the fisc some kind of fiscal rules, and uh, many of them, you can see from the uh, first table, uh, the, which is in the left corner, um, the majority of countries have two fiscal rules, and uh, this is because uh, mostly one of the rules would be the internal rule, and the, the second one will be an international rule imposed by some uh, for example, currency union or other treaty that they are a part of. And also because one fiscal rule cannot address all the situations and it is too, uh, too often is uh, violated. Uh, how are the rules implemented? Uh, as you can see from the last ta table, uh, very few countries implement the rules in the Constitution. The majority adopt special laws for the fiscal rules, and in some countries there is just a political consensus that the fiscal rules should be in place. Um, but of course, the most difficult uh, rule, uh, the most difficult is the implementation of these fiscal rules because. Uh, uh, many, uh, in many instances, the rules are uh, not hold uh, the rules are violated. Uh, so what did the countries uh, do to enforce their, these rules? Uh, first of all, uh, you, uh, a country should have a reliable data collection and forecasting capacity. So for example, if you employ uh, the uh, limit on the uh, budget deficit over the cycle, you need actually to find out in which place of the economic cycle uh, you are currently uh, now. 
So uh, this re requires quite a lot of economic research. And some countries uh, adopt special fiscal responsibility laws that require governments to disclose the information uh, so that the public could see that the government is not playing with the numbers to somehow overcome uh, these fiscal rules. And a few countries uh, implement, uh, establish independent institutions that obviously have a longer planning horizon than the governments, and these institutions either monitor implementation of the fiscal rules or set the budget assumptions uh, for the governments. Uh, so to conclude, I would like to make four statements. Uh, fiscal rules are a tailor suit rather than mass production. So for each country, uh, there is a unique set of fiscal rules and uh, instruments for their implementation. Uh, for every fiscal rule or set of fiscal rules, you can find a country which was very successful with them and you can find a country which was a complete disaster. Uh, fiscal rules are not ne neither necessary nor sufficient for fiscal discipline or prudent fiscal policy because obviously it's very easy to violate them and uh, very uh, complicated to enforce. Institutions, uh, civil society, so some independent research institutions and so on, uh, can be helpful in implementation of these rules in enforcement. But the main thing is uh, the willingness of the government to adhere to the rules, so political will. And uh, the final, finally, although fiscal rules are a disadvantage uh, for governments uh, that uh, work under these rules, they can uh, bring political dividends for the governments who introduce the rules. Uh, because by introducing fiscal rules, the government sends the signal that we are forward-looking, uh, we are willing to constrain ourselves, so we are like, thinking about future generations and not about the next political cycle. So. And uh, the, the one last remark that Ukraine actually has a fiscal rule embedded in the budget code, but it's it was observed until uh, 2014, but obviously for, uh, for the reason that we are not as much dependent on Ukrainian government, this rule is now violated. Okay. Elena, thank you very much. <laughs> At this stage, I would like to open the floor for uh, questions for the audience. Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, and coffee break is approaching, and uh, I ask you uh, to be as precise as possible and to really ask questions. If you want to make a statement, uh, we unfortunately don't have the time for this. Thank you. Uh, and name yourself, please. Vladimir Panchenko, Institute for Social Studies. Uh, my question is to Ivan Miklos and Natalie Resko about uh, NAFTA gas. Uh, tariffs raised and uh, NAFTA gas is only planning until the end of this year to develop the plan how it will be restructured. Uh, nevertheless, when uh, the tariffs were uh, to be raised, uh, there was uh, uh, hope, well, in fact, uh, the obligation that immediately the restructuring of NAFTA gas w would uh, take place. I know you are not Kobolev and uh, he is responsible uh, for that, but uh, it's uh, to sell, like you said, to sell uh, the reform to nation, you have to uh, give it uh, something in well, advance. So what, what do you, you think, how, how they cope with that problem? Because so it is I, really a problem. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think um, the actual restructuring of NAFTA gas is not the critical element for the population to understand why we're increasing tariffs. I don't disagree that the restructuring of NAFTA gas is critical. Um, the natural gas market law just was adopted, therefore they're on their way. Uh, I'm not sure the president signed it yet, but it's been adopted by the parliament, so it's almost there. Um, and um, the EU third energy charter and the entire EU I don't even know what it's called, but the, the bureaucracy of the EU is working with NAFTA gas to move it forward very quickly. The other things you can say about NAFTA gas, they finally, you'll understand this, had their 
2012 and 13 audits done and their 2014 audit is about to be done, so there's a level of transparency. If, if the argument is to our population why tariffs had to be increased, I think the argument isn't because Naftogaz needs to be restructured. I think the issue is, number one, it is better for every citizen of Ukraine to receive the subsidy in his pocket than to try and figure out how much subsidy for that same difference in price went to Naftogaz, first and foremost. Second, it's better for the population to understand the price so that they use less so that over time, we all become more efficient in our usage of gas. The country becomes less dependent on imports from wherever, and in particular from Russia, but we've already done that. Number three, I think the issue is also the state-owned enterprise management is not particularly trusted at this point by most Ukrainians. Now, we can change that over time, but until then, wouldn't you rather this money be going through the budget in a very transparent fashion to the citizens of this country rather than to an entity which in the past has been untransparent? The move to, sub to, to, to move the subsidies away from Naftogaz and to the population doesn't depend on the success of Naftogaz restructuring. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't, in my mind, the two aren't related. Again, it's not, in my mind, the unbundling is critical, and one of the big positives of unbundling will be that we'll be able to attract foreign investment into the three pieces of Nafta Gas, transmission, storage, and uh, domestic, um, what do you call it, excavation, not excavation, what is it called? You know what I'm thinking. So uh, by then bringing in those foreign investments, we improve technology, corporate governance, and in the end, we eliminate Nafta Gas as a murky state-owned enterprise, which it was in the past. Again, I'm not suggesting it is today. I'm in the past, um, hopefully once and for all. But I, I don't think the unbundling, in my opinion, is how we sell it to the population. I think we tell the population very specifically that there isn't a country in the world that can subsidize 80% of the price of gas and be fiscally responsible or can control inflation or that we, that we were one of the most inefficient countries in the world with regard to it. And there's one other argument, and that is that the rent seek, and this is harder for me to explain in everyday language, how to, how to say it. You'll understand rent seeking behavior, but the, the average citizen won't. The fact that we have multiple prices for gas in this country, rather than a commodity price, means that somebody, and this is in any country, but in particular we know it, somebody was cheating Somebody was getting through false documentation, quote unquote, cheap residential gas when they were using it for industry. So not only were we subsidizing the population, we were subsidizing a large amount of corruption because of this rent-seeking behavior. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the language to sell it, as you just described, but we have to get that to the population. We weren't subsidizing just the citizens of this country. We were subsidizing a lot of industry they could more than afford to pay market prices, but we're you know, invoicing improperly, registering it improperly, and we're basically stealing the subsidies that, go, that should go to the most vulnerable part of this population. Uh, if I may add, I completely agree with my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can only add that really, well, this may be very simply to say people that one of the main reasons, one of the really important reasons why Ukraine is in today's desperate situation is regulation of the energy prices. And I agree that it is necessary to restructure uh, Naftogaz and other companies, and not only restructure them, but also privatize them. Our Slovak gas industry is the most profitable company. We privatize 49% and we sought also management control over this company. We are criticized hugely, but it helped not only the company, but also economy. Also because big state enterprises, big utilities, are a huge source of corruption. And potential corruption, even in the country in which a government is fighting against corruption, big state-owned companies are potential source of corruption everywhere in the world. In the transition countries, even more than in other parts of the world, which means not only restructuring, but I'm convinced also privatization of the, of the utilities, among them also Naftogaz, this solution. 
Thank you. Uh, we have time for two questions. We are running out of time. So two questions. So this part of the audience already asked questions. Yes. Just may I uh, let other? But is there um, any questions here on this side? No. I'm okay. Hi. So go ahead. Thank yes. You. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you for using time. Let me, I, I will be yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we, we, sorry, sorry for this. For, sorry for this. For this. <laughs> we, have, we have a question from a lady, okay. please. Uh, and you will this be is, the last one. <laughs> this is sort of a more, um, the communication aspect of the ministry, because we're talking about a lot of things that in this room people understand, but outside of this room, people have no idea what's happening. Is there a way that the ministry can sort of get that information of what you guys are doing, what you guys have done, why is it important, and sort of kind of make it into a layman's terms, Ukrainian, so people who watch the evening news, the Stada Baba in the village can sort of say, oh, okay, this is what's happening. Like, is there sort of that plan going around, or is it... The question so, is to Natalia, right? So, yeah. Anyone we're, not, we're not doing a good enough job in communicating. There's no question we need to do better. I think most of the ministries, uh, I'm not speaking only for mine, but most of them have implemented, you know, social media, uh, which hits obviously the middle class and not the Baba in the village. Um, many, um, many ministers, many, um, many of the ministries are reaching out on our television and our, our, we, we, we travel to the regions. Everybody's traveling to one or two regions every month or two. Um, to get out of Kiev because Kiev is also not typical of Ukraine. Um, I, I know we can do better, but I, I will I will be honest with you. It's it's also a matter of time, and I, I see this even internationally. We don't get the message out enough uh, about what we're doing. I sat on a panel in D.C. last week in the World Bank with the Minister of Finance of Honduras, the Minister of Finance of Egypt, and the Minister of Finance of another country. And when I said that we increase tariffs, well. Let me put it this way. The Minister of Honduras said we waited 11 years for the right time to increase tariffs and eliminate energy subsidies, and we did an increase of 11 percent this year. And then I went and I said, well, very interesting. We didn't, we didn't, we're not waiting for the right time. There is no right time, and we just increased them 450 percent. The room went, oh, you know, and nobody can imagine that from Ukraine, but we're not getting the word out ourselves, even internationally. And it's just a combination of, I think, the amount of work there is to do, you know, I, we, we welcome everyone, you know, Vox Ukraine is helping gr tremendously getting the word out about what's going on, good and bad, and that's important. Um, but people, the government alone can't do it, I'll be very honest with you. I, I, I can't explain why other than there are just so many challenges. We're all trying uh, a lot more. You see a lot more infographics coming out, things that are hopefully simpler. Um, again, uh, but but it just seems that there's a, there's a lack of time. And um, I, I, I take the criticism and I, and I know we need to do better. Yes, uh, thank you. All I have relation. Uh, global Ukrainian is my best affiliation. Uh, I, uh, I thought of whether I should give a difficult or easy question, but uh, given my friendship with uh, both uh, Natalie Yurasko and Ivan, I'll make it easy. Uh, on a very no small and narrow issue, the uh, shadow economy, uh, first just a technical question. Have you at this stage some estimate of how much can be uh, squeezed out in taxes there. Secondly, a more policy-oriented uh, question. Uh, most past research on uh, reasons for people going into shadow economy come to the conclusion that it's not so much the taxes that they are avoiding, but the uh, burden of bureaucracy related to taxes and regulation and so on. That clearly makes it a job a job not only of the Ministry of Finance and the Tax Administration, but also the regulatory arm, namely your, your partner, uh, you know, the Minister of Economy. Is, I mean, are, are how, what kind of policy approach are you taking to this? Um, I, I, I don't think the, the tax part of it is so much a regulatory. So I, I think it's not, it's not the tax burden. I mean, you know, individual Ukrainians, generally speaking, if they have one place of, of work, they only have, they don't have to even file declarations. So compared to a European or an American tax system, this is simple here. The burden is not great. Um, why then do people not pay uh, their payroll taxes? Why do in an entire business, does everyone uh, register as an independent entrepreneur to get a flat tax rather than participate as an employee and have a payroll tax? I think that is the tax rate issue. 
41% uh, payroll tax is a heavy burden, and the way businesses think in Ukraine and the way Ukrainian employees think, they think it comes out of my pocket. Even though some of it's supposed to be the business, you know, there's the employer-employee element, but they don't think that way. They think net, and they think, you know, what am I getting at the end of the day, and so does the, the employer, and it's the reason that they, the employers participate in this and allow 100 people working cash registers in a retail store to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> Yet they come to work nine to five, they work in front of a cash, that's in no country an independent entrepreneur, except here. Um, so I, I think it's very much the payroll tax rate, number one. Uh, number two, I think it's the corporate burden, tax burden issue, the corporate rules and regulations, the multiple sets of books that for small businesses often encourage them just to register as independent entrepreneurs and not corporate payers. But I think there is a larger issue here, and it's not going to be solved quickly, frankly speaking. We can reduce tax rates, and we can make it simpler, and we will. I'm confident we will with, with Yvonne's help. I think there is a general ennui, a general refusal to acknowledge that you know, paying taxes is your civil uh, duty. And it happens when you have corruption of I don't know how many years, let's say at least 23, possibly 100. Uh, and you believe that your taxpayer dollars are not going to anything of any value. The roads are terrible. I still have to pay a, a bribe if my kid wants to get through high college. Uh, if I want to have a medical procedure done in the state's medical system, I still have to pay somebody. I still have to bring my own food. I have to bring my own sheets. And I think that this is very much for us about delivering uh, services. When I think the population starts to see there's a value to the tax pay tax payments they're making, not that there's another Mercedes or another I don't know uh, some kind of uh, dacha somewhere. When they start seeing medical services which are either state funded or not, but at least you have a clear vision. When they start seeing schools that are you know of, of a quality with the computer equipment. When they start to see that their tax revenues are improving their roads. I, I think that we can start to, to, together with tax reform, um, and I'm not saying it's one or the other, start to change the mentality. But I don't think it's enough for us to change simply tax uh, rates or even burden, because the average, you tell me, but the average Ukrainian citizen says, why should I pay? I have, you know, I'm planting tulips in the potholes in my road here. That's, that's an attitude that's very hard to break, and that's probably, again, delivery of services changing what people care most about. Medical services, uh, pensions, education, they want their children's lives to be better. And until we can convince them that their children's lives can be better, that we're using the revenues properly, we're going to have this constant battle um, where people just don't want to pay, period. Again, I, you know, 15% uh, in personal income tax, that's the reform that they did in Slovakia. We already have that rate. Um, you know, the 18% progressive, inc progressive income tax rate, we moved to 20, affects less than 2% of the population. 98% of the population pays 15%. And, you know, it's not going to get lower than 15, frankly. I mean, you know, we'll look at it's, it can't be lower. So it's not about complexity. It's not about the rates, per se. There's also a culture here that we need to break through. And we, we have a responsibility to help change it. <clears throat> Uh, very short, very short comment. I agree that it is not about about rate, but it is about simplicity, and neutrality of the system, which means it is about cleaning the system. Uh, how much shadow economy? Nobody knows, but too much. It's clear. I just participated in one discussion, and there were est there was estimated that in the retail sector in Ukraine there is approximately 20, 30 percent is black market, and about 30, 40 is shadow market. This unbelievable figures. And payroll taxes, 48 percent, and, no, and almost nobody is paying. There, there's bad news, but also good news. Because if this is true, then if you will have a really radical decreasing, you will even receive more than you are receiving now. Mm -hmm. And this is good for a really radical reform and radical change. At last point, maybe this, because this is really about, about also psychology. People have to believe that this time is different that this really will bring changes that they will be ready to pay taxes also. Uh, thank you very much to everyone, especially to uh, all the panelists. It was a great discussion. Thank you very much.